Welcome to the Broken Pie Chart Podcast, episode 140. I'm your host, Derek Moore, and this week, going to be talking more about inflation, but I've had some questions recently about, hey, isn't housing just going to get so unaffordable that nobody can, can buy it? And I'm going to call this the housing mirage, and I'll explain. So when we look at housing prices, it's easy to kind of see, okay, what's the what is home prices appreciated to? What's the average home price? What's the median home price? But what's left out of that is it's never really adjusted for inflation. And it's never really adjusted for what your mortgage payment's going to be. And the reality is, if your mortgage payments, you know, $1,000 now, and home prices go up 10 times what they are now, and you buy a new home, your mortgage payment is only a little bit more than a thousand because interest rates went super negative. It's really not, well, actually if, if super negative means, anyway, that's, let me backtrack that. Let's say mortgage rates went down and your home price, your home payment, your mortgage payment didn't really go up that much on a monthly basis. Housing's not necessarily getting less affordable. And so I think there's some um, some people call it statistical crime when you look on the news and they start talking, throwing numbers out. And so I thought it'd be interesting just to take a look at a few different factors on what I think on housing. And somebody, Pat, I'll put it in the show notes. Uh, somebody put me uh, in a link, sent a link to me. Um, this is John Wake's Real Estate Decoded. Looks like that's a, a Substack or a, no, this looks like a regular website. So I'll throw this in the show notes. And he had some data. I, I can't really see the data behind it, although I guess I, I could recreate it if he's using. Uh, but he claims that really on a real basis, on a inflation adjusted basis, housing is cheaper now than it was back in 1990. So I thought, let me let me go through this. And there's really two arguments on housing. One is it's getting more expensive and it, it certainly has gone up this year. And then the other aspect is we've never really seen rates this low for this extended period of time. And although rates have tick, ticked back up, I'm talking about you know a 30-year mortgage rate, they are still historically very, very low. And so I pulled some data here and I said, what's the, okay, let, let me explain some of these terms too. So whenever you hear me say real, that means it's adjusted for inflation. And this is another thing sometimes that people go in and out of real versus nominal. So real means adjusted for inflation. Uh, and, and basically that just means, let's say if you had a $100,000 house and you had 10% inflation, you would say, well, the real increase was zero because all of that increase from 100 to 110,000 was based upon 10% inflation. So your real increase is zero after accounting for inflation, okay? And then we say nominal inflation or nominal numbers, that does not include inflation. So that just means it was X price today and 20 years from now it's Y price. It's just nominally what it, uh, what it does. But everybody knows, I mean, if, if you made $20,000 in the late 70s, that's the, that's the same as having, you know, 120000 today or something like that without doing the math. I shouldn't just throw that out there without doing the math, but you kind of get where I'm going. And so I took a look and then we have there's average and there's median. If I was to take the average home price in the U.S., that includes Bill Gates's mansion, Kendall Jenner's mansion, I think she's a, a billionaire, right? Mark Cuban's mansion, George Soros's mansion. So when we say median, median sort of throws away the top and throws away the bottom. And it's, it's uh, you know, if you think about a, a pineapple, you cut the top, you cut the bottom, and you have the, the, the juicy part in the middle. So that gets rid of the top, gets rid of the bottom. So the median, the real median, Home sales price in the U.S. in 1990 was 123,900, uh, according to Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. I'll put a link to in the show notes to that uh, that data, so you can see that chart. And then through Q3, so that was Q1 in 1990. Through Q3 of 2021, it was 404,700. 
And first of all, when you see that, uh, this brings up the annualized problem as well. So when you see that, that's 226.63% increase over, I guess it's, you know, about yeah, 31 years now. 1990 to 2021, 31 years, you say, wow, things have gone up 226.63%. That sounds like a lot. But when you annualize that number, and what that means is what it what did, when we look at that price increase, each year, what's the compounded growth rate? Meaning if you bought at 123900 and you sold it today at 404700 what was your annualized uh, increase? And uh, just an aside, I, I, without doing the numbers, that's less than the S&P 500. But 3.89% is the annualized return there. Okay. So, and, that, and that's real after inflation. That's, a, that's uh, annualized. Cause, and that's the other thing. A lot of people, sometimes what they do is they go, they use a nominal number, then they use a real number, then they annualize it, and then they adjust it for inflation. And so if you're, if you're doing this, you have to stay real, real. And if you're using medians, it's real median to real median. You can't go interchanging them. Okay, so that's, that's interesting. And you say, okay, well, that, that's, that's certainly not as daunting when you think about... Now, granted, I mean, that's, um, you know, on a real basis above inflation. Inflation's probably averaged around, you know, 3% 3, 3 or so since 1990. I, I'd, I'd have to go look. But my guess is two and a half to three and a half, somewhere around there. So then you say, okay, well, now people point to that and, and say a couple things. Yes, that's true, but it also means the down payment has never been as less affordable. And then other people will point out and say, well, what about incomes? Aren't incomes not keeping up uh, with, with everything else? So I, I pulled data. This is real median income. In 1990, household real median income was 57677 And this is an estimate, so we don't have the end of 2021 yet, but I found an estimate was 79900 You say, well, ah, there we go. So plus 38.53%. That's not 226%, is it? No, it's not. And here we have, uh, and this is real, these are real median incomes. So that's only 1.06% annualized. Aha, so there's the problem, right? 3.89% annualized uh, after adjusting for inflation versus 1.06% annualized. Okay, so that is not as much. But let's look at this. So a down payment on that median home price, 123 and change in 1990, if we take 20% as 24,780, 20% of 404, 700 is 80,940. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So, uh, and by the way, that's increased by the same amount, 3.89% annualized real uh, since 1990, just the same as the home price, right? You're just taking a, a, a percentage of, of what you've already done. And people might point out and say, aha, uh -huh, so that's, that's the issue. So, but let's see though, the, the payment, um, okay, so here, here's the thing. Here's where the nuance gets in. So I know that, that the first inclination is to say, well, wait a second, people have got to come up with 80 grand today. And I know I'm using medians, right? And every market's different and every, every house is different. And this data says, okay, you need to put down more money. Now, there are loans available and, and I'm not a, an expert in the mortgage area or, or real estate, I don't pretend to be. But certainly if you want to put down less than 20%, there's FHA loans, there's loans you can put down 5%. Things like that, okay? But set that aside. There's also arms, right, where you, you have a fixed rate for five or 10 or seven years and then it floats and you can, you can sort of, anyway. So what I looked though is, I looked back and I looked at the chart on the, uh, the site I, I talked about. It's realestatedecoded.com and I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes. And the mortgage rate in 1990 was nine 
0.8% on a 30-year fixed. I just looked uh, up some quick numbers, and it's about 3.5%. We know it was lower than, it was actually dipped down below 3 at one point. So here's what, where it gets interesting. Uh, on that median home price in 1990, you got to put down the down payment. You're, you're financing uh, 99120 at 9.8 percent, that's uh, about 858 bucks a month. When you finance 323k, which is after the down payment of 80k, at three and a half percent, that is 1,454. So that's that's principal and interest. Now, so basically, your payment has gone up. Uh, although home prices have appreciated 226%, your payment has only gone up 69%. And annualized, it's only 1.71%. So this sort of is interesting. And and by the way, if um, um, you know, if if you sort of look. And you say, well, wait a second. What if we had 9.8% interest rates today? What would my payment be? Well, it'd be 2,795, I believe, if I did my math correct. So this doesn't include taxes, doesn't include insurance, anything like that. And But I do think when you're looking at, at things like housing, you have to account for the monthly payment. And I don't have the data on, on autos, uh, SUVs, autos, all that stuff. But look, I mean, part of the reason why they've gotten more and more expensive is the fact that interest rates are lower. And unlike housing, you know, we're not doing 150-year loans in housing. Auto loans used to be a few years, and now they're, you know, 72 months, five years, six years. Uh, six years is 72 months, right? Uh, I've seen some longer than that, which is a whole other issue because with a house, typically, historically, you know, if you look at the uh, not only the Schiller data, uh, the Case Schiller index, but then you also look at uh, uh, oh, who's the guy? Jer- Jeremy Siegel uh, from uh, from Penn, who wrote stocks for the long run. You know, he points out over the long, long run, stocks pr- or houses pretty much keep up with the the pace of inflation. So, I bring this up because, and oh, and by the way, with with my point on cars was that you have a depreciating asset. So my fear is that as they extend more, more time onto the end of these loans, and you have a de- depreciating asset, depreciating asset, you're going to wind up having people come in upside down, meaning their debit on their loan is is more than their their car is worth, and. I've heard of people needing to refinance the old debit into the new debit. Anyway, we're talking about housing. So I bring all this up because, look, I I think it's – I want you to have the ability when you hear some of these numbers to start thinking about, okay, what are they actually telling me? And am am I really getting the best information from here? And the most afford the most thing or the thing that deals the most with affordability is your your monthly payment. And what percentage is that of your your take home salary and things like that? So, anyway, I hope this is is helpful. But um, it is interesting too. Now, I'll I'll just spend a second on the on the John Wake um, real estate numbers here. And one of the things he did was he went and he took uh, uh, in in his post he said twenty twenty home prices are lower than in nineteen ninety after adjusting for inflation and mortgage interest rates. And what he did was, since inflation data basically also has shelter, which part of his rent, part of his his, uh, owner's equivalent rent, and the way they do that, that's another discussion. But he backed out the, the home price or shelter appreciation from inflation and because he said, look, you know, in his view, uh, you put in the the, uh, the notes here. Um, if since Case Schiller itself, and that's the index, directly measures home, quoting from his, his article, uh, directly measures home price inflation, it's better to use a deflator that doesn't also incorporate housing price changes. So he uses CPI 
dash U, uh, less shelter as the deflator. Basically, that that's your inflation adjuster is what he's saying there. And what what he did was he created an, an index. And he created an index where 1990 was the, the baseline. And so 1990 was the, the baseline there. And essentially what, what he said was uh, accounting for inflation, you know, it's only up about 16% from 1990. And I thought that was, that was really interesting to, to sort of take a look at. And he's got some other numbers too. He's got a uh, 30-year fixed mortgage rate and monthly principal payment index. And he's saying it, basically the monthly payment per dollar borrowed relative to 1990 is we've had a decline in that. So again, I'll, I'll put that in the show notes. You might find that uh, that interesting. Now, speaking of prices, by the way, uh, one of the interesting things I've noticed as well is I think I think we mentioned it when I was on with uh, Jay Pastorcelli. Uh, we will we are scheduled to record another episode next week, so we'll be talking about uh, some of the the themes in the markets. But we have seen a decline in the price of container shipping, kind of like staying with inflation and prices. And I noticed uh, there was uh, the Financial Times had uh, a little write up, and they had a, a graph which was the price to ship a forty foot container. That's basically one of those containers from China to LA. It had been uh, peak close to, I think, 20, uh, maybe 18,000, 19,000 per container. And now it's back down below 10. If you could see the chart, it spiked and then came back down. So uh, we have seen container prices coming down. We've seen, at least in China, according to freight waves, they have uh, you know started to to clear some of the backlog, the amount of ships out there. Uh, we'll see what happens with uh, uh, the ports of LA and Long Beach. But I thought that was a, a good sign. And and a contrarian thing, and I've not, look, I'm not a container shipping expert by any means. It's just something that was interesting to me in late 2020. I said, well, this might be something to keep an eye on. And it turns out it did. I've been wrong plenty of times on other stuff. But I do find it interesting that we're seeing, you know, mainstream uh, media. I saw an article on our local news here in Arizona that talked about container shipping prices, and it reminded me of uh, the rice crisis back in. I don't remember what that was. was that late '90s, early 2000s. I think I've told that story before, where Catherine Lee Gifford was showing a chart of rice prices on whatever that show was that they, her and. Um, her co-host would sit around and drink wine and talk about stuff. Um, I mean, you don't even see rice prices on CNBC. So maybe that is a contrarian indicator that some of the shipping stuff will uh, starting to get ironed out. And then this week, I think the next focus is going to be on some of the central banks. This week, we've got, I believe, uh, Regional Bank of Australia. I shouldn't say Regional Bank. It's, the, it's basically the Fed equivalent in Australia. Uh, they are going to be, I think, first up with an interest rate decision. That should be on Tuesday. And then the Bank of England, uh, Central Bank of England, they will have a another uh, decision on interest rates as well. And then, of course, our Fed. So we're going to start to see, you know, a lot of people making predictions and projections on what's going to happen with interest rates. And I think we'll start to see a little more of that in focus. And certainly the GDP that uh, was at least the first print, um, so just kind of back up for a second, gross domestic product, uh, the third quarter ended in September, and we just saw the first advanced estimate of GDP for Q3. Uh, that was at 2%. That was below expectations. And remember, expectations started out, you know, most of the, the shops or, or, or analysts had it you know, above five, I saw some above six. So you have the first estimate that comes out in October, the second estimate for Q3 in November, and the final, uh, final, final GDP, which would be the close out the, um, no, I, I was going to say close out the year. It was to be the last announcement of the year, but for Q3, and that's the final one. 
And so I think uh, that may give central banks a little bit of cover, at least in the U.S., because they could point to, hey, you know, GDP came in a little bit less. But um, as I always say, I mean, just your core holdings in a portfolio should have some sort of hedge or, or buffer in them. And you want to not try and make decisions based upon these new swings day to day or trying to predict what, uh, you know, what's going to happen with markets. Because uh, the reality is that over time, and I can't tell you how, many, how often I see this, uh, people will say that there's going to be a, a 50%, 60% market crash. They'll say it again and again. You look back and imagine if you had not been in the markets over the last 10 years and heeded some of the, uh, I'll call it quote unquote advice from quote unquote experts that you, uh, that you see out there. And the reality is uh, people say this stuff all the time and they've been wrong a lot. They'll be right at some point. And I always go back to housing. Uh, people were calling for a, a crash in housing. And guess what? They weren't wrong, but they were calling for it in uh, not necessarily 2008. They were calling for it in 05, 06, 07, and, and things started, you know, kept going up. So you never quite know. Anyway, so with that, I will leave that there. Hopefully that's valuable. I want you to start thinking about when you hear these numbers, how to interpret them. You want to think about, are they inflation adjusted? Are they using averages? Are they using median? And how do you annualize this stuff? Because the annualized is is really, you know, we think about markets. We we typically, you know, nobody says, "Hey, the S and P is up three hundred percent over X number of years." You say, you know, well, the S and P was up about X percent per year, or they'll give you an, an annual number. But with uh, with housing, for some reason, uh, people get anchored to ha- home. You know, the home price they paid uh, the pay home price, the price they paid for the home and things like that. So, um, but I'll link to, uh, I'll link to that data. I'll link to, uh, some of the stuff on the St. Louis, uh, Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. And we'll be back next week where I think I want to talk about, uh, Rubini came out, uh, you know, the author of the, the Black Swan book, he came out and called, uh, crypto a tulip bubble. I think that will be a ripe topic for Jay and I to discuss. And I may take my role as a skeptic or I might take my role as a, uh, you know, a promoter of it. We'll see. Usually we, we try and take a, an opposite side and have a healthy debate on it. Until then, have a great week and we'll talk to you soon.